Well, when I was first editing a magazine in 1971, it was a meat market magazine, uh, an IT magazine. Uh, we had a full-time staff of five people. Um, you wouldn't find that today on a meat market magazine uh, in the IT arena or indeed in any other kind of specialised arena. So we had far more stuff, we had much more time to look into issues, uh, to do research in depth, to identify new trends that were coming up to be able to write about those. Today, uh, with fewer staff, uh, it's much more a question of identifying ideas that readers will want to be interested in and then realising those ideas as swiftly as you can, uh, often uh, with a considerable amount of PR input. I mean, I bec I'd been a staff journalist before I became a freelance, uh, and I became a freelance uh, way back in 1974, I'm probably the oldest freelance in captivity, uh, because it was a, a, a choice that I wanted to make. I saw it as part of a lifestyle choice. Today, of course, um, some people are being forced into the freelance world, uh, almost as it were, against their will. Uh, every week one reads of redundancies from newspapers and magazines and there are no other, uh, very few other jobs around at any rate, so people have to become freelance. Well, I think the, being successful as a freelance is always about the question of asking yourself the question, what have uh, I got to offer that other people haven't got to offer? And really identifying what it is you can offer to other newspapers and magazines. And to think more broadly about your, your work as a freelance. I mean, uh, perhaps you're, you're going to be writing <coughs> uh, feature articles for magazines or newspapers. Perhaps you might just decide that you can, you can write some, some uh, non-fiction books or perhaps uh, write for PR companies or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole you know, range of different kinds of uh, freelance work out there and you need to identify um, which you feel you could be successful in doing. Well, I think if you look at any area of newspaper or magazine publishing, um, the leading titles are always trying to differentiate themselves against other titles in the area. In other words, it's really a question of classic marketing. You decide who your audience is going to be, uh, and then you produce a product which meets that audience's needs. There's nothing particularly new about that. It's gone on ever since uh, newspapers and magazines started to come out. You know, they, 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 they identify who they want to reach and then they craft their content in such a way that it's going to be attractive to that potential audience. And that kind of thing is certainly the sort of thing that goes on today. Perhaps these days um, it goes on in a more sophisticated way because uh, increasingly you'll find that uh, newspapers and magazines don't just have um, uh, the hard copy versions, they'll have websites, they'll have social media activity. So it's a question of uh, thinking right across the piece there yeah. uh, and deciding how you can differentiate your particular product uh, across all of those media in order to reach the audience that you want to reach. Well, I think uh, there are a number of issues here. Uh, one is the basic standards of good quality journalism, and I think they remain the same as they always have done. Uh, you've got to get, get your facts right, and you've got to tell the story I in an honest and objective way. Um, we've had scandals about hacking and all of that sort of thing, um, and of course um, uh, there's a role for investigative journalism, but when uh, questionable practices are being used, um, they've got to be used um, uh, in, a, in a good uh, end which serves the public interest. An example of that would be um, the Daily Telegraph's uh, exposure of the uh, MPs' expenses scandal. I mean, uh, you know, that was based on uh, information that had been acquired by what we might loosely term nefarious means, but it was in, in the public interest to do so. Uh, so checking facts and, and telling the story objectively, uh, those are still the benchmark of good journalism. But uh, they're benchmarks that don't necessarily always apply in what you call the blogosphere. Right. 
Um, and the blogosphere essentially uh, is something which is you know, having a free ride on the back of uh, quality journalism because um, with one or two exceptions the blogosphere is not doing the in-depth detailed research uncovering new stories understanding complex issues and all the rest of it all of those sort of good things that well-trained and professional journalists do it's just commenting uh, with varying degrees of uh, authority, uh, sometimes none, uh, about issues that other people have already written about. So in, those, in that sense, it's, it's having a free ride. Um, so I think there will always be uh, a strong market for the kind of good quality journalism that I've just been talking about. Well, can you spot a, 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 an executive that's had media training? <laughs> the answer is uh, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. But I think really the important point to make about media training uh, is that there is uh, good media training and there is bad media training. And, and sadly, there's a lot of bad media training about. Good media training is the kind of training that... Uh, that helps an executive to actually be helpful and useful to a journalist during the course of an interview without necessarily uh, talking about things that might be of a confidential nature within that company. Um, bad media training is the kind of training which treats an interview as uh, just sheer gamesmanship and point scoring between the interviewee and the journalist. And that's entirely the wrong kind of media training. I think where we go wrong here a lot of the time is that um, people see uh, television interviews, um, news night, you know, jousting with Jeremy Paxman and all the rest of it, and they think that that's the way that all kinds of interviews should be conducted. But it's not the case, because uh, that kind of television interview is, is essentially um, a spectator piece, um, whereas the sorts of interviews that print journalists do are information gathering activities. Um, and that is done in a completely different way than the kind of um, uh, sometimes aggressive but confrontational nature uh, of a typical television and sometimes radio you know, today program yeah. type interview. And what print journalists will, try be, will be trying to do is to get interesting information, useful and relevant information. And so media training should really be training um, uh, executives and others who face the media to be able to approach a, a print uh, media interview in that way. Other cultures? Um, interviewing executives from other cultures is always different uh, and we're, we're, we're dealing in stereotypes of here course. because people are human beings yeah. and every human being is different. Um, on the whole, uh, UK executives are, are going to be perhaps a little bit more reserved. US, North American executives um, are going to be more outgoing. Um, on the continent, uh, people can be uh, rather anxious about what's going to be written about them in the press because um, the press on, uh, in some continental countries is less aggressive, less uh, investigative than it is in the United Kingdom. But I mean, as a, as a, a journalist, I frequently get emails from PR companies saying something, you know, like Hiram J. Winkleberger III is, is flying in and uh, he'd love to talk to you about uh, the latest developments in the Winkleberger Corporation. And I say to myself, you know, why do I need to meet this fellow? I mean, what, what's he going to tell me that I can write about? Well, uh, I think what they have to tell their client is that what the journalist will be looking for <coughs> is a story which is relevant for uh, his or her newspaper or magazine. If you don't have a story that's relevant for his or her mag newspaper or magazine, you're wasting your time in contacting them. I think uh, interviewees win you over by giving you the information that you're looking for. That's the way interviewees win you over. They win you over by being helpful, by answering your questions, 
uh, honestly and fully and as fully as they can, uh, and by generally seeing where you're going and trying to come along with you. Um, it's the people who are sort of constantly looking over their shoulder at what they're saying um, uh, and that there's maybe at senior managers, how senior managers might react to what they've said, uh, who are perhaps being less helpful. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on the whole, really, journalists love people who are being helpful and trying to be helpful, even if um, uh, what they can say is fairly limited. Um, I, I think no. I think uh, I don't see uh, much change in that, uh, despite all the all the media training uh, that we've had. Uh, I think what you tend to find is that middle managers are the people who will be less candid about things. Senior managers at board level, uh, board level directors, they will probably speak more freely. And interestingly, small business owners, they will also generally speak very freely about what they have to say. It's that, it's that middle echelon, uh, and I guess it's because they're kind of constantly looking over their shoulder and wondering how what they say will react uh, on their own uh, image within their own organisation, who tend to be most uh, nervous. I, the three main courses I run, one is a half day course about writing press releases, key message there, always, always, always get the main topic uh, of the press release into the first sentence or paragraph. Um, another course is called the Perfect Pitch Masterclass, it's all about pitching ideas for articles, interviews, briefings and that kind of thing to journalists. And the idea there, the main point there is always craft an idea for a specific journalist, identify that journalist's interests rather than send out a generic piece of background information. And the third course is about writing articles for newspapers, magazines and websites and there the key lesson is always identify very closely with what it is your reader wants to know and make sure you follow that through in every paragraph of the article. Future? Definitely not, uh, definitely not, and I think there's some strong in, uh, evidence to suggest that we won't. Uh, for example, um, we've recently seen the closure of the News of the World, which at the point of closure had about 2.7 million readers. Almost all of those readers have transferred to other newspapers on Sunday, and, and we've seen that in the uplift in those other newspaper circulations. We've seen the launch of the independent spin-off I. That's uh, ju only just uh, had its record circulation. And there are other very encouraging stories from the print world. So no, I mean, the newspapers and magazines have been here for more than a century, and uh, I think we're going to see them for uh, at least another century as well. Well, uh, it, it has a place as a... As a an area where people can give their own opinions but in my opinion it's not a substitute for properly researched and objectively written journalism um, as, I, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, where you have um, a website which is offering some unique and specialised information um, web, uh, paywalls are going to work quite well. Uh, Financial Times is a very good example of that. Um, where you're offering more general kinds of uh, entertainment type journalism, such as for example The Sun does, then I think that's, that's a bigger call. That's, that's, the jury's still out on that one. Um, there have been some successful paywalls and there have been some unsuccessful paywalls. I think at the moment a lot of people are looking at the uh, New York Times paywall which seems to be extremely successful and the model that they've got there which is one where you sign up for a month, uh, you get 20 articles free and only after you've had 20 articles free does the uh, charge start to, to click in. So, I mean, I think we're right at the beginning of looking at how paywalls might work, and there are all kinds of different models of paywalls, and some will prove to, to be better than others. Well, you see, I think you make a false distinction there, because in a sense, 
Uh, all publications are niche, as I've indicated earlier. All publications differentiate themselves, whether they're a national newspaper or magazine or a very specialised title or a journal. So the, the publications that will be successful are those which identify their market, which differentiate themselves from others and which provide what their audience wants. And that will be applicable whether they're national newspapers like the highly successful Daily Mail or the eye title which I've just mentioned or whether they're niche publications about a very specialised subject. Speaking personally, I've always been a great reader of newspapers. I like the experience of reading newspapers. It's almost a kind of tactile experience in some ways. I spend at least an hour a day reading newspapers, sometimes more. Uh, and I shall con certainly continue uh, doing so. Um, in some ways it's a more enjoyable experience than getting your information from uh, a screen uh, and some, in, in many ways more flexible. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's a fast-breaking story, certainly I'll be on the internet seeing how that's developing. Well, the first thing I'd say is that if you want to be a journalist, it's going to be very, very tough indeed. Very, very tough. And you've got to be the kind of person who's prepared to take a lot of knockbacks along the way if you're going to make it. The second thing is that you have to look at your own strengths and weaknesses and decide what it is that you've got to offer that other people can't offer. And then you've got to build those weaknesses and present those to potential uh, employers or, or potential uh, media outlets uh, if you're going to be uh, a freelance person. And the final piece of advice is um, just never give up. You've just got to keep pushing all the, all the time. Never give up.